Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When Dr. King famously proclaimed the content of character over skin color, his words were a reflection of the teaching of the Bible, which proclaims its content at the expense of our identity. The Bible strips us of identity and agency so that its content may be shared without inhibition or limitation by anyone in any situation at any time to anyone who is willing to hear. If the person speaking happens to be someone you knew before they knew the gospel, someone you towered over in their childhood, if you can't hear the content of God's wisdom from this person, the only one losing out is you. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 53 to 58. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 309 of the Bible as Literature podcast. You know, Rich, when I first became a priest, it was interesting around my family. Because generally speaking, people who knew you when you grew up, knew you as a child, have a hard time seeing you as a teaching authority, especially in a religious context. It's very confusing and disorienting for many, especially in the beginning. Over time, those who are serious about wisdom are able to ignore the person delivering the message and focus in on the content itself. But it's interesting that, as in life, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus identifies and calls out the problem of family identity— Of course, in Matthew, in the context of the genealogy and this question of being a child of Abraham, a member of his household as a Gentile, obviously the question of tribe is even more complex. It's not as simple as not wanting to hear that kid you saw grow up suddenly lecture you on the meaning of the gospel. It's the fact that in some way it undermines the authority of your household, because if a kid you raised is now speaking with authority, something that you're struggling to accept, he's threatening whatever it is you think you gave him. So there's a tension in Matthew between what Jesus is delivering, which comes from the mouth of his true father, and what comes from the worldly household of his own tribe, his own nation, his own family. This is how the gospel functions against the problem of identity. Well, I know that you are X, therefore I know Y about you, which may or may not be the case. Millennials and Gen Z are always afraid about labeling people, yet at the same time, they're obsessed about identity. This is just a new flavor of the same thing we've been dealing with for a long time. Now, once you assume you know something about somebody, then you assume you know everything about that person, and you no longer have the need to listen to them. The problem of cancel culture derives directly from the problem of identity. If you said X, if you think X, if you did anything like X, Y and Z are invalid. Based on what? based on an ideology, because if they do X, then it means that they cannot be in this ideologically pure camp of whatever you think. But if you are not following identity, then they may be wrong on X, but they may be right on Y or Z. Wisdom evaluates what is being said and what is being done, independent of who the person is. Jesus is constantly 
trying to reinforce this among his disciples because, like we've said before, the final exam comes when they have to see the teacher and the Son of God on a tree being crucified and shunned by the world. How are they going to understand that without their minds being blown? If it were cancel culture, then it'd be obvious that Jesus is not the one we thought he was, and they cancel him, which they tried to do, but then Jesus came back and told them, I'm not going to allow that to happen. But Jesus had to push it, because even after the last moment, Jesus had to push this idea that identity won't answer your questions, only wisdom will. The mechanism you describe with cancel culture is, in fact, the same mechanism. The difference is that where in a cancel culture mentality, you're trying to gain ascendancy over the dominant narrative in a tribal slash family metaphor, the one who's offended by wisdom presented on the lips of an underling begins with a presumption of domain. The assumption of the tribal community is that we control the narrative and we produce this person. But the scandal of the disrupted genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 is, in fact, you did not produce this person. And we know from our study of the Roman household in the New Testament and its relation to the Abrahamic household that ultimately who sired whom is irrelevant in Scripture. It's who instructed whom, which is why I keep stressing in our tradition and in the Roman Catholic tradition of our beloved sister church, the one who teaches you is called father or, in a monastic setting, mother. Because that person is responsible for providing direction and instruction, whether it's a parish community or a monastic community. This is how we understand family in a biblical setting. So the scandal here is that Jesus, who they presume is under their authority because he, in their minds, is a biological son of their tribe, he belongs to them, they think they can claim him, because of that very fact, they're not only scandalized by the wisdom he's presenting, But in this case, it's that rare occasion where the identity that they impose on Jesus, this fake human lineage, thinking of Genesis, it's the human seed gone awry, they're imposing that on Jesus, and that fake identity makes it hurt, because they really think they own Jesus. The opposite of identity, of course, is functionality. I may have male chauvinistic tendencies. When I'm in a classroom and the professor is a woman— In my mind, I may have a prejudice because this is a woman and I have male chauvinist tendencies. Therefore, this professor is less worthy of respect than a male professor. We all know this is incorrect. That person is a professor. The gender is not relevant. They teach. Therefore, they are professor. Therefore, I conduct myself with respect towards that person. What if that person is 15 years younger than me? They're the professor. It doesn't matter. What happens if this person is a disabled person? It doesn't matter. The person is in the seat, is in the chair of the professor. Therefore, I listen. Therefore, I learn. When I talk to somebody, I don't waste time. I either teach or I learn. It doesn't matter who I'm talking to. We just have to figure out who's the professor and who's the student, and then we can get on with the business. It's not about ego and me showing you that you have to learn something from me. It's how do we function so that everyone is learning and teaching. You and I joke because everyone in the United States wants to teach leadership, but someone needs to teach followership because sometimes it's your time to lead and sometimes it's your turn to follow. If you have a room full of leaders, you have enough ego that it flows out the door. Sometimes you have to be a follower and sometimes you have to be a leader and you can't be a leader without followers. It's about functionality. It's not about the identity of the person. So many people, because they have issues with their parents or issues with authority generally, struggle to be an alpha, to function correctly as an alpha. Because if you don't know how to submit, even when you have difficulty with the authority to which you submit, you will never exercise authority correctly. It's a fundamental principle. That is why kids today in college have to have adulting classes because no one was ever an alpha to their beta. They were never apprenticed. On Saturday mornings when I sat down with my cereal to watch cartoons, one of my uncles or my dad 
from the front of the house without even coming in the building, shouted my name angrily, and I knew my Saturday was over because I had to follow them around on whatever projects they were doing. So even though I'm not particularly interested in construction, I understand it. Even though I'm not interested in running gas lines, I know how to do it because I sat with my dad when he worked on the gas lines in our house. This is gone. And it's a huge problem. So remember this principle that in order to be an alpha, you have to first learn how to be a beta, which, by the way, reflects the wisdom of Paul's teaching about the Roman household in the New Testament. When I taught at the University of Balamand in Lebanon, I was the professor. Therefore, when I was in the cafeteria, I did not get up. I looked at one of the students and they would bring me food or bring me a napkin or bring me a drink. When I would walk down the hall, if there was a student in front of me, I didn't open the door. They opened the door for me without my asking. I had a position as the professor, and they would say, professor, and they would let me pass. All the other professors had been students there and had done the same with their professors. I had never been a student there. Father Paul came to visit the university, and we sat down and were having lunch, and he pointed at a salad, and he said, I don't have enough tomatoes. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and then I realized I had to get him tomatoes. I was not ontologically the professor. I was functionally the professor when I was with the students. But when I was with my professor, I was functionally the student. It was my turn to go get him tomatoes. Sometimes you receive the tomatoes. Sometimes you give the tomatoes. But you have to understand that you're not ontologically the son or ontologically the father. You function as the son or you function as the father. Everyone has a belly button. Many of our listeners will have heard that expression before. You know where it comes from. But you have to remember that in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, but specifically here in Matthew, the umbilical cord ultimately pertains to the gospel. It doesn't pertain to your biological tribe or your biological parentage. It pertains to the instruction. And if you understand that, then the one who speaks most credibly about the content of Scripture and can read the actual text most clearly in the original language in any given situation, when they speak, they are the parent. When Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. He came to his hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Right out of the gate, Rich, I want to observe briefly that he refers to it, he being Matthew, refers to the synagogue as their synagogue, synagogi afton. It is their synagogue. Just think about this for a minute. Matthew is already telling you that Jesus doesn't belong to his family. He belongs to the teaching. That is where his belly button, so to speak, was once connected in the womb. It's important because the word hometown is patrida, which is his patrimony. Jesus was teaching parables. Then he left. Then he went into his patrimony, into his patrida, and he taught. Jesus is only functional vis-a-vis the teaching. When it pertains to God, he's the Son. When he is among the people, he is the voice of the Father. This is how we hear the teaching. When the teaching comes out, this is the voice of God. It's just like we always say in church, whoever is reading the reading is the mouth of God. Which is why in our tradition, the bishop, the priest, the deacon— It doesn't matter if the patriarch of Constantinople is present. If a 12-year-old stands in the middle of the church to read the letter of St. Paul to the assembly, everyone has to shut up and submit to her. I love this tradition of the reader facing the high place because the reader, be it a little child, when they read the letter of Paul, they are judging the clergy. And notice here that the crowds are astonished. Always be careful when the crowds are astonished, when they say, wow, 
Look at this wisdom. Look at the powerful works. In the next verse, we're going to see how they use this as a twisted compliment against Jesus. I want to point out what we said recently about the mob. The mob has a role to play in tyranny in human history and also in the Gospels in many and various ways. So as you think about what it means to have an amazed crowd in Matthew, think about how many people are selling out their integrity right now in our culture because they're concerned with what the people think. Because it's the same mechanism. And everybody knows it. They know this is a problem. That if you give the people what they want, it eventually leads to a dark place because mobs have a part to play in tyranny. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get all these things? That last question is infuriating for those of us who study scripture because it demonstrates their ignorance. If you don't recognize what Jesus is saying, it's because you're not reading the Bible. You don't value the pearl of great price. You're not interested in wisdom. That's the thing. When you preach the gospel in a familial or a familiar setting. I'm extending the word family because it goes beyond your immediate or even extended family. When you preach the gospel in the midst of people who knew you when you were just a kid and you didn't have a collar and you didn't stand up to teach with authority, you quickly learn who is actually interested in wisdom and knowledge and who is interested only in what they have to say. What we're teaching isn't ours. It was handed to us. It's not a showdown between the one teaching and everybody else. It reflects exactly God's admonition to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's not you they hate. It's ultimately not Jesus that they have an issue with. It's the author of the text that Jesus is expositing for them. Where did he get these things? Pothen. From where? When right before this, we had the three parables of the kingdom, the thing that sought the people who seek it and what they seek it with. At the very end, he said, remember in verse 52, therefore every scribe who is instructed into the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a householder, which brings out of his treasure things new and old. Interestingly, that was the last parable. The one who is read into the kingdom brings out things new and old. And then everyone says, where did these things come from that Jesus is saying? The answer, if you're reading the book of Matthew, is the kingdom. These are the teachings of the kingdom. These are the teachings that are the kingdom. These are the teachings by which you gain the kingdom. And if the people don't understand, it means the kingdom is not here. So when Jesus goes to his patrida, to his hometown, to his patrimony, it is not the kingdom, because they don't understand where he got these from, and the only way you would know where he got these from is if you understood the last three parables where he explained what the kingdom is. How did he get these things? He just explained it to you. The backhanded compliment, wow, we've never seen such wisdom, we've never seen such fantastic works. Where did they come from? Well, if you actually had paid attention to his wisdom and his fantastic works, you would have listened to the past three parables, and you would have known it was the kingdom, and you would also realize you're not there. And here's the heart and soul of the matter. And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. Of course, the word offense is scandal, scandalon. They are scandalized by the teaching. That kind of scandal is not a scandal in the negative sense. It's negative for the people who are offended. It's not negative for the one delivering the scandal. Because as we know from Paul's letters, they are tripping over what Jesus is saying. It's a scandal to them. It's a stumbling block to them because it undermines their power, their dominion over 
their patrimony, which they're trying to assert over Jesus, who belongs to no one. He's free because he's a slave, not of his patrimony, not of his earthly masters. He is a slave of his father through his father's instruction. And he's only without honor in his own house. Yet at the same time, he is the ultimate ego despotin who brings out the new and the old from his house. He is without honor in this house. Why? Because everyone wants to rebel. Everybody in his patrida wants to be the father of the family. And when someone comes in is bringing out great wisdom and great works and bringing out things new and old as a scribe who is read into the kingdom, who does he think he is? When what they're really saying is, why does he think he can take my stuff? Why does he think he can take my house? Why does he think he can take my patrida? Why does he think it's his? Well, the only people who say that are the people who think it belongs to them. And this is exactly the problem. Like you and I were talking, sometimes you go and teach and someone says, I'm so grateful that you taught because I was able to learn something. And then someone else says, yeah, I don't know if we want him to teach because we're afraid that someone might disagree with what he has to say. The person in the second group wants to run everything and is afraid of what the person is going to say, rather than say, let him talk and we'll see if what he says is valid. We'll measure it against scripture. If he makes a good case from scripture, then we can learn. If he can't, we won't ask him back. What's the reference point? What's the arbitrator? It's scripture. If the patrimony submits to what Jesus is saying, and accepts the scandal because it is for them a scandal, not just because this person whom they perceive as a punk they knew when he was little is suddenly speaking with authority and saying something they've never heard before. In one sense, it's new to them because they don't read scripture anyways. But it's also new in the sense that if what he's saying is true, that means suddenly we have to commune with people from outside our patrimony. It brings new people into the fold. It's that play on new and old, right? It sounds new because he's explaining the kingdom to you from the scriptures that you've never understood correctly to begin with. And he's showing you the implication of the kingdom is suddenly your family doesn't matter. It's God's family, and God's family includes both the wheat and the tares. So those Gentiles you think that you've protected yourself from by establishing your patrimony, guess what? They have a place at the table in this house, which isn't your house. It belongs to the Father of Jesus. That's disquieting and discomforting. How many people take seriously the commandment to broaden the table in their household and invite strangers? Everybody listening to this podcast who's hosting Christmas, are you inviting anybody from outside of your family or your circle of friends? It's an important question. Unfortunately, if you are inviting family and friends to your house, you're already going against what Jesus says in Luke, which is that you're not allowed to invite friends and family over to your house for dinner, but only the poor because they can't give anything back to you. If this truly is the kingdom, then everything is functional according to scripture. And it's not about give and take and an exchange. You know, we were laughing the other day about the oxymoron gift exchange. If it's a gift, why is there an exchange? If there's an exchange, it can't be a gift. What one imparts is wisdom. What one imparts is a teaching. If you do not have a teaching, God willing, someone in your midst does have a teaching, and you can learn from them. The only exchange that there can be is with this teaching. But every time an exchange happens, I'm the father and you're the son if I'm giving the teaching. If you're giving the teaching, then you're the father and I'm the son. It's functional. The reference point is the kingdom, and the kernel, the base, the core of the kingdom is this teaching around which the entire kingdom is formed. And these people are outside of the kingdom because they still don't understand that there's this teaching at the core that Jesus is bringing to his patrida. And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. The word miracles here is dinamis. The word dinamis, of course, means power. He did not show his might because of their 
apistia, their lack of trust. Their lack of trust in the value of the content of what he was sharing. They couldn't see past their idolatrous projection of identity. Jesus has no identity. He's a slave. That's why he submits to Pontius Pilate in the New Testament. He is a slave, and he bows down to the Romans. He's not bowing to the Romans. He's bowing to his father. That's the key point always. But that is a scandal, ultimately, because you're part of my household, You're part of my patrimony. We're from the same clan. No son of mine is going to bow to the Romans. Don't tell me you don't speak that way. Every one of you, your child comes home from school bullied. You coach them to fight back. Unless you're really not very wise. You fight back in some way. Whether you tell them to punch back or you tell them to report it to the school, you fight back. You don't say, well, since you're a son of the kingdom... You have to submit. You don't say that. So don't tell me that it's not scandalous for you. You claim your child, and then you push your child into conflict, because that's what human parents do. This is, of course, the natural reaction. The problem with the natural reaction? They were amazed at his wisdom, amazed at his mighty works. They asked all these questions, which showed that they weren't paying attention, and they didn't understand. And as a result, they were amazed by his mighty works. He didn't do as many mighty works there because of their lack of trust, because their apistia, which their unbelief, their anti-belief, their inability to trust, their unwillingness to trust, they trusted in themselves, they trusted in their own identity, in their own mastery over their house and their synagogue. It's interesting what you say, because someone reading this text uncritically would assume that their unbelief simply means they didn't trust. But as you said, Richard, in a previous episode a few weeks back, it's not just about what is said, but about the striking omissions, what isn't said that you would expect to be said. They don't talk about what they believe in. So the implication is that their belief is in themselves, their own tribe, their own family. So there's a tension. That's the heart of the scandal. Is it what I gave my daughter or is it what God gave her in her adulthood and set her apart for the ministry of the teaching? That's the question. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.